long separations. Our friends' children had birthdays, graduated, got married, and had babies, which left us always wondering how the world could even keep spinning without Jeff and Kevin in it. At church, we tried desperately to hold back the tears as other people's prayers seemingly were always answered. Carol continued to join every support group she could find, and I fiercely guarded the evenings when I could be home alone with my grief. But as we continued to take one step at a time, other events happened as well. More of our soldiers were killed in Iraq, others died in car accidents, and yes, even some died by suicide. And it occurred to us that maybe this was the reason we were meant to continue to serve. We personally knew the pain these families were feeling, and we could genuinely connect in a way we never could have before. As we tried to comfort the broken hearts of the people God put in our past, an amazing phenomenon has occurred. We've received more healing, truly in our spirits, than we've given them. They seem to help us more than we've helped them every time. Gradually, little by little, we could feel ourselves growing stronger, and we began to smile and even laugh a little again. We could continue, continue to share stories about Jeff and Kevin as they gave us more joy in their short lives than many people get in a whole lifetime. The more we talked about them and shared stories with each other, the more we realized they weren't really gone at all. They were with us everywhere we went and still a part of us. We carried them everywhere we went again, and we began the first stages of healing, and I was preparing to retire. I had prepared my resumes, and I was ready to go. As I was finishing up my last year in the Army, I was honored to be getting ready to retire as a colonel in the U.S. Army. On September 22, 2004, I was attending a conference at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, I'd never been to Fort Benning, Georgia, but because our son Kevin had graduated from airborne school there, I was especially thinking of both my boys that day. You see, September 22nd just happened to be Jeffrey's birthday. And since Kevin had received his jump wings in that very place, it seemed like my boys were standing just right by me. My cell phone rang, and it was my two-star boss. Congratulations, Mark. You're on the list for Brigadier General. I have to tell you, not one time since we lost the boys had I ever felt closer to the boys. I felt like at that very moment, one was standing on my left and one was standing on my right. I knew where I was supposed to be and that there was a mission for me to continue to serve our country. It seemed like my boys were following me all along. The same Major General that made that phone call to congratulate me had just seven months prior knelt at the cemetery as he presented the American flag that draped Jeffrey's casket. And I will share with you on a personal note that during my promotion ceremony to Brigadier General, that same General officer, as he pinned on my stars, leaned over to me and said, Jeffrey's name is engraved under one star and Kevin's name is engraved under the other. As a general officer, I now wear stars on my dress uniform and symbolically know my boys are always there with me. I wear a military bracelet like many of you. Mine has my son's names on it, Jeffrey and Kevin. I only take it off when I go through airport security. We have had butterflies, ladybugs, and rainbows appear at incredible times. And only those of you who have lost a loved one know the significance of these unexplainable coincidences. Whenever I would drive the boy's car, a special song might start playing just as I turned the key. To us, and most likely to many of you, we believe that these signs are not coincidences. Friends have made quilts from Jeffrey and Kevin's blue jeans, their t-shirts, and their uniforms. And we are so grateful to so many people who have helped us channel our grief in positive ways. We have experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows. But through it all, we have clung to our faith and to each other, and we have become more determined in our life's journey. We hold on to Jeffrey's fiance, Stacy, and Kevin's girlfriend, Heather, as if they were our daughters-in-law. We value each and every relationship we have, and we take nothing for granted, nothing. There will always be a hole and a void in my heart. Some people might interpret this as weakness, but my boys will never be a weakness in my life. They will always be my strength. In the last seven years, we've experienced so many wonderful moments and met the dearest, kindest peoples. People, but we would trade every bit of it back just to have one more moment with our boys. But because we did not get a vote in this plan, everything we do is in memory of our sons. 
when we visit wounded soldiers, we know that each and every one of them could be our son, Jeffrey. Had he survived the IED attack, he would most likely be an amputee, severe burns, and struggling with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. I believe that God merges past during the course of life's journey, and I would like to share one particular experience that occurred while we were stationed at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. Carol's sister had asked us to find a Paducah, Kentucky soldier who had lost his leg while serving in Iraq. She knew he was recovering at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. That very Sunday, we were attending the morning chapel service at the hospital. Turned around after the service to greet a soldier. When I went up to meet this soldier, I asked him his name and he said, Staff Sergeant Bradley Alexander, sir. Well, wouldn't you know, what a coincidence. This was the soldier that we found instantly that Carol's sister had asked us to find. Having never met him before, no knowing nothing about him, we were certainly excited to see him, missing, missing his leg. And when you looked at him, like many of you know, buddies in the Marine Corps will do, Brad looked at me and said, honored to serve, sir. Well, now, Bradley Alexander was recently married in San Antonio, Texas, and I was part of the wedding, so I'm happy to say Brad is doing better after a lot of surgeries, a lot of care, and some help. Our experiences have shaped our thoughts and our focus. Soldiers like Brad Alexander remind us of Jeffrey and the tragedies of war. Jeff did what he thought was right. He believed in his nation's cause and his own leadership abilities, and in the end, he saved several soldiers from certain death. They told me so. We pledge to use Kevin's death to raise awareness in the military to the dangers of untreated depression, post-traumatic stress, and traumatic brain injury. We are compelled to speak out for all the Kevins in the world who have no voice. Seven years ago, someone had told us we could survive the death of even one of our children. I would not have believed it. For us, it was like the twin towers of the World Trade Center falling down. If even one of those towers had fallen down, it was, would be beyond belief. But to think both towers came tumbling down is truly unimaginable, even today. Over six years ago, I entered this lieutenant to be my aide de camp. Out of all the lieutenants at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Lieutenant Joe Quinn seemed like to be the best one. Very polite, smart young man, sharp West Point graduate. But I chose him because of his military service in combat in Iraq. Joe had served in and around Fallujah doing the exact same missions as Jeffrey had done. I wanted an aide that understood the sacrifices so many were making. What I did not know until months later was that during his senior year at West Point, Joe's brother Jimmy was killed in the World Trade Center on 9-11. Joe's brother was a 23-year-old stockbroker for Cantor Fitzgerald and was on the 101st floor. Joe and his brother, Jimmy, had been much like our son, Jeff and Kevin, best friends as well as brothers. More than just understanding the sacrifices being made in Iraq, Joe understood my personal pain and I understood his. When I learned of Joe's brother's death, I encouraged him to share with me about his brother, Jimmy, and then I, in turn, felt comfortable sharing about Jeff and Kevin. Well, Carol convinced Joe to contact our daughter, Melanie. You know where this is going, right? Well, they immediately had a lot in common, sadly. They had a common bond bro brought on by broken hearts, but they also had an understanding of military life, and they had an unbridled zest for living still. Well, they've now been dating for over six years and seeing them as a sight to behold. Now, Captain Joe Quinn completed his second tour in Iraq, this time for 15 months. Joe was awarded the Bronze Star Medal by General David Petraeus. Joe decided to separate from the Army and has since graduated with a master's degree from Harvard University in May of 2010. Following graduation, Joe went to Afghanistan as a civilian and served as a counterinsurgency advisor to General Petraeus and his staff. Joe recently returned home on 23 December 2010. Our daughter Melanie, who had experienced more pain and sorrow by the age of 20 than most people do in a lifetime, continues to be our inspiration. She made the decision to continue to follow her dream of being a nurse and to use her pain and grief to help others for the rest of her life. 
In May of 2009, Melanie graduated from Western Oklahoma State University with an associate's degree and registered nursing degree. She passed her national certification boards in June that year, and in May of 2010, Melanie graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a bachelor's degree in nursing. Melanie is currently serving as a neurology nurse at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, and I am happy to say Melanie and Joe are engaged now to be married and will be married on 9 July 2011 in West Point, New York. As you can see, life really continues to move forward, and there are great triumphs, and they give us great hope. A Rabbi Kushner, in his famous book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, tells us of an experiment that was conducted at a leading university psychology department. He said they tested a number of volunteers to see how long they could keep their bare foot in a bucket of ice water. One thing that proved true time and time again was that if there was just one person in the room, the subject could keep his or her foot in the bucket of ice water twice as long. The mere presence of another caring person doubles the amount of pain a person can endure. As we all know, that one caring person is so often those here today, in uniform and not in uniform. As you continue this important work, serving the nation and taking care of your comrades, please know that there are support agencies out there. There are others here to help you. You can also lead those in need to care. Please know that you will certainly change lives and likely save lives by helping someone else. I'm also convinced that no matter how much ice water I'm forced to place my feet in, as long as we have the love, support, and encouragement of others, we can withstand any of the challenges that are placed before us. Our journey is not yet over, nor is the journey for so many of you here today. There is still a terrible stigma associated with behavioral health and depression, not only in our military, but in the society of our nation. We are working hard in the military to ensure every door a service member goes through is the right door to get support. Our military is different from the past, and there has to be a new school of thought in town on how we treat and care for soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. We all need to get on the new school bus and help others. We must make it a sign of strength, not weakness, to come forward and seek support, and that leaders, commissioned and non-commissioned officers alike, need to encourage others, and they need to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. We are here to enlist or re-enlist all of you today to empower our military and communities with the education and tools it takes to break through the fear and stigma that surrounds suicide. We must help all Americans to stay with us, and we can start by helping one Marine, one soldier at a time. One life lost to suicide causes a ripple effect that is felt for many years and truly for the rest of their lives. Perhaps some, some of you today here have experienced the loss of a family member or a friend to suicide. And like us, you are still riddled with guilt that you tragically missed the red flags that might have saved his or her life. We applaud the efforts of our senior military leaders from the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates, to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen. We also applaud the efforts of our service chiefs of staff and the vice chiefs of staff in the Army, General George Casey and General Pete Corelli, and certainly the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General James Amos, and the Vice Commandant, General Joseph Dunford, and also the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Command Sergeant Major, or Sergeant Major, I'm an Army guy, so command our majors, kind of. Carlton W. Kent. Leaders like this make a difference. And a special thanks goes to Lieutenant General and Mrs. Kelly for sponsoring this conference and for their leadership, for what they do for each of us each and every day. Their leadership has been instrumental in ensuring the military's message is in, is, that it is a sign of strength, not weakness, to reach out for support. Our suicide prevention programs need to reach every person serving the nation and their families, not just during once or twice a year mandatory training events, but they need to become a part of our culture each and every day. We all need to be very vigilant and educate each other in suicide prevention. Know the signs and escort a comrade to care. Don't just tell someone you need help, take them to get help. The loss of an American service member's life is a tragedy, regardless of the reason. 
I now ask you to join me in a moment of silence. 